big believer that um, you have to, to become an entrepreneur, you just have to do it. There's no point in thinking, overthinking things. Beyond a point, you can't do analysis. If you feel that there's an opportunity, if your gut tells you to do it, just go ahead and do it. But now let's assume you've done it. You've now taken the step, you've got your startup going, and um, you're looking for funding, you're looking to get your product out there, you're looking to get your first customer. So that's what I call in some ways phase one of any startup, or let's call it the survival phase. That's the phase in which you're basically checking out whether you have the ability to get your business from just an idea into reality. So let's assume you get beyond that phase. And you know, in that phase of the survival part, you really are not thinking about anything other than just getting the first step done, take the first step and move on, and make sure that your business is actually able to thrive and go forward after that. And so really that, that phase, as I say, is a survival phase. For most people, it is once you get the first funding, you are in some ways beyond that survival phase. And you'd start then thinking about, okay, what comes after that? And of course, all of us think about how to keep growing the business, how to take the business forward. And I think one of the things that most entrepreneurs do not think about as hard as they should in their evolution, especially after they've actually crossed the first and the most difficult hurdle, really is how to build the organization as well. And the reason I say that most people don't think about it is because uh, it is actually a very, very critical aspect of growing your business and being successful in the long run. But unfortunately, we get so focused as entrepreneurs in terms of what we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of fighting all the business issues that we're dealing with, that we don't actually think about what underlies our company. And that what underlies the company really is the organization behind it. And ultimately, it is the organization that has to deliver whatever you want it, whatever your aspirations are in the future. And so my view is very simple, that if you want to create a leading business, if you want to create a world-class business, you cannot do that without creating a world-class organization. And I think that's a very, very fundamental truth that most entrepreneurs do not realize in their journey. Part of the reason is that a lot of entrepreneurs are young, uh, and so therefore they've never really worked in large organizations, and so therefore they perhaps don't understand the importance of, especially as you become a little bit bigger, what is required to run a large company or a growing company, and so therefore they don't have the understanding of what are the issues that crop up, what are the issues that need to be addressed. Uh, for entrepreneurs like me, who are, let's say, let, let me say, later stage entrepreneurs, in my case, for example, I started my company, Renew Power, when I was uh, in my mid-40s. Uh, I had already worked for about 20 years in various large organizations. Uh, I had, you know, seen what, is, you know, what are the issues in working in large organizations. And so as my company grew, I was able to at least relate the problems that I was looking at or facing with some of the issues I had, fa I had seen in larger organizations. And I was able to understand the kinds of systems and processes that you need to have to be successful when you become a larger company. And so right from day one, my focus always in Renew Power was how to make sure that we build the same systems and processes so that when we become a larger company, we have the right base in place. And so in a way, what I'm gonna tell you today is not about the first steps that you take as a company, but really more about what is required as you start scaling your company up and as you start really competing with the outside world and let's say larger competitors come in or you become much larger yourself. And what are the kind of challenges that you might face and how to address those and how to make sure that you put in place the right building blocks early in the organization's evolution so that you're able to deal with some of these issues as you become bigger. Because once you've really crossed a certain size, after that, to try to go back and redress some of these issues becomes much, much harder. And I have worked in organizations that have seen the consequences of what happens if you use every single part of your bandwidth for growth, which is what most entrepreneurs end up doing. And you don't use any part of your bandwidth to construct your organization. And if you, if you go down that path, and if you focus all your energies only on growth, then the consequences of that could be that you get to a point where organization is actually not able to handle, it does not have the capability to handle some of the growth issues that then start throwing up, coming up. And so therefore it's very important to build the, build the organization in that, in that context. 
So let me just tell you what some of those issues are in terms of building the organization. You know, the, the, the question of course that comes up is, what is an organization? Is an organization hiring people? You know, you go from 20 people to 50 people to 100 people, and is hiring people just simply sufficient to say that here is my organization? And I think all of us would say the answer to that question is not really. It's not just good enough to hire people, you also need to have the systems and processes that allow these people to interface with each other, that allow different departments to interface with each other, right? that allow a certain way of working to emerge between these people so that they're efficient and effective. Because if they're not efficient and effective, instead of hiring 20 people, you may need to hire 40 people, or you may have 40 people eventually who are dissatisfied with what they're doing. So you need to have the right systems and processes of how these people are meant to engage with each other and how they're supposed to interface with each other and work on a day-to-day -day basis. So the question is then, you now have two things. You have people and you have systems and processes. What else do you require in an organization to make sure that it is structured the right way? The other things that you require that are very critical is you need a culture. And you have to make sure that you shape that culture within your organization. You cannot let a culture just evolve. If you do that, it will happen in such a way that it may be outside your control. You may find dysfunctionalities creeping into the organization. So you have to make sure that you do very tangibly and deliberately work on creating the right culture within the organization. Now, what is culture? You may ask, right? So to me, culture is the following. The, the a culture is represented by what is the vision of the company? Where are you trying to get to? Do people in your organization know what the eventual aim of the organization is. Because if people know what the aim is, they're able to then align themselves behind that aim. And they're able to work much more effectively behind that goal. If they don't know what the aim is, they'll all be doing their little bits and pieces, but they won't actually have a proper sense of what the organization is trying to achieve. And therefore, they'll be less effective in their jobs than they could have been. The second thing is, you need a mission, right? So what is a vision? A vision is the overarching goal. A mission is what are the five or seven or ten different things that you're going to do to get to the vision. So it's important to tangibilize the vision into some articulated mission steps that are easier to understand and comprehend, that give people actionable steps. And the next thing is, you need to have a set of values in your organization. Values are very, very critical. What, again, does your organization stand for? Does your organization stand for being high integrity? Does it stand for looking after people? Does it stand for team working? Does it stand for agility? What are the things that you want your, your people to focus on? So having a right set of values is very critical. Now in our company, in addition to a vision which we put in place literally one or two years after we got started, along with the mission, we also put out a set of what I call work principles. And the reason I put out the work principles is because I found that as the organization was growing, the challenges on the people was changing. And so the work principles that I put out really were nine work principles. And these are meant to be really in some ways uh, guides to individuals working in our organization. So what were those things that I had put down as work principles, which I thought was relevant in our company's context. And therefore, in any other company's context, those could be different, you know, and so on. So in my case, or in our case, for me the work principles were, number one, throughput. Get things done and get them done on time. Because it is very important for us to make sure that our project execution was on track at all points in time. Number two, the second uh, work principle was take responsibility. Because the buck stops with you. I didn't want everything to keep coming up to me for decision making. I wanted people at different levels of the organization to be responsible for taking decisions by themselves. Number three, think end to end. I found that when you give problems to people, and when you tell them, get something done for me, most people I found were limited in their thought process. If you ask them for something, they just give you that limited piece of information back without trying to understand what you were truly trying to get at. So if you're a smart employee, you try to think, oh, this, this, this person, my boss has given me this work to do. What is he really trying to achieve here? And can I therefore address the problem in its entirety? Versus, okay, I've been asked to get this data, let me pull it out and give it to him, 
right? So a lot of people I found tend to work in that manner. And so therefore I wanted my employees to think a little bit more broadly about what was being sought and what are the challenges that you were dealing with. Then uh, I wanted people to start managing risk themselves rather than throw, you know, not, not be focused on risk issues. So that was one work principle. Then I wanted people to focus on quality. So I said one of the work principles was obsess on quality. And one of the important principles was build the organization. See, whenever somebody does something, especially in a growth organization, you can just get something done yourself, right? And the second time you have to do it and somebody else is perhaps doing it, then they can also rediscover a, you know, a different way of doing the same thing. Or when the first guy does that same job, not only does he do the job, but he also puts in place a process of how that job is meant to be done a second time. And so the, the second time somebody else then does the same job, he actually knows how to do it because it's a well laid down process. And so therefore a very important aspect was don't just do something the first time yourself, also put in place the right process to do, the, do it the second time. And so therefore building the organization was something that I tangibly put down as one of our work principles. And then the last, the last work principle I said was that look, this is not a nine to five, five day a, job, five day a week job. This is essentially a job that is meant to encompass your entire life. You have to keep thinking about this. Now perhaps this was fond aspirational thinking on my part that I could get all my employees to be as bought into the company and what we were trying to achieve as I was, but certainly I had put it down as something that people had to think about. Now as you become bigger, what you'll find is, and let's say you've crossed two, three hundred people of, you know, in terms of total employee strength, what you'll start finding is that as a CEO and as an entrepreneur, you perhaps had direct contact with everybody in the organization. You knew people's names, you knew what they were doing, you knew when they joined, you knew about their family members, and so on. But as the organization becomes bigger, having that connect becomes harder. And you find that there are people who you haven't actually met before, who've been working for you for the last three months or six months. And so the connect begins to decrease. And so the big challenge becomes, how do you transfer your own entrepreneurial mindset into the organization much more deeply so that everybody has the same, what you may call, the founder's mentality? How do you make sure that that cascading down the organization happens? So that's an important thing to consider. And so there, as, a, as a leader, you have, therefore have to find ways and means of reaching out to everybody within the organization very regularly and interacting with them, either through town halls or through interactions with different sets of people or meeting every new employee in groups when they join. So whatever you may decide to do, but you have to do that to make sure that you're able to translate your own vision to people when they come on board.